Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today it is the 23rd of August. Today, most of our focus will be on the Pokrovsk front because the updates here are really important to cover. We're then going to look at Toretsk and move on to Luhansk and of course the Kursk offensive. But as I said, I really want to put an emphasis on the events over here and highlight some of the reporting that is coming out surrounding actual anecdotes from Ukrainian units that are operating in this part of the front line. In addition to, of course, geolocations confirming the location of Russian soldiers. And so as we zoom in, we have just a few minor updates in this sort of southern vector of Russian advance, which you could see really has expanded since the capture of Novozhelana and Zhavitnya and has given the Russian squads here a forward base and some local roads through which to continue pushing south. And as a result, they were able to capture Ptiche, as we talked about in yesterday's video. And as of today, they've just been inching through some of the open fields in regions where the Ukrainians do not have any sort of fortified positions and they are beginning to close in on Kalinova as a result. If we're measuring it, they're only about 700 meters from the first dachas in the northern part of that hamlet and then two kilometers away from the actual heartland. And in the process, they're also getting control over hills that directly flank Ukraine's defense line that is being built or has already been built over the course of many years in these trenches that are sort of vertically built east of the E50 highway and of course Mikhailivka and Selidove to the west. So that's also something that you really need to keep in mind when you see these Russian advances through this particular direction. It is involved in shaping the battlefield in a way that would be conducive for future attacks towards an area like Selidove. But a lot of the focus today has been more so on what's going on further northwards. Although we don't have a lot of footage from Novohrodivka and Hrodivka respectively, we do have a lot of information coming out, which we'll see if it's confirmed in the coming days. Based on what we actually do have in terms of the geolocations, this is from the, uh, the 23rd of August. It's a Russian assault squad. They were able to actually infiltrate into Novohrodivka, reach some of the apartment buildings, and begin storming them, clearing out a Ukrainian presence. So they did this by throwing in grenades, through the windows into Ukrainian holdouts and they were just engaged in these three battles recorded by Russian drones. So this gives us an indication that the Russian forces have this really strong vector along the rail line which really has been aided by their capture of Mikolaevka which helped sort of push the front line forward and then strengthen it out once all the flanks were secured. And so now they have this forward operating base through which to begin pushing into the town directly and they have been able to really really quickly infiltrate past the perimeter defense line over here which you see marked in light yellow you would imagine that had the ukrainians had their full manpower capacity in this region and an appropriate amount of firepower that they would be able to repel the initial frontal assaults because the russians really only arrived in this region over the past week so it has not been a protracted ukrainian defensive campaign outside of novohordivka Despite that fact, clearly they were lacking in this frontline region and had to cede control over their trenches towards the Russians. And that's after years in which they were built. A lot of them built in 2015, expanded in 2019, once again expanded in 2024. Then the issue is some of the older ones they weren't attended to, especially over the course of the first two years of the war. There was only a ramping up in late 2023 in repairing some trenches and building new ones. And then some of the ones that were built more recently, they aren't fully complete. So again, just that's sort of some context for some of the defenses here. But again, none of that really matters if there's no actual soldier remaining some of these forward trenches, like the one over here south of Orlivka. It's highly doubtful that there are any troops even located here. It just sort of, sort of turned into an abandoned gray zone. And then it allows the Russians to advance through this rail vector without as much pressure on them. So we can see here that in the yellow, the Russians were able to capture additional territory, finally begin their infiltration, pushing through local government offices and a lot of high-rise buildings here. So this is some of the first urban fighting that we've seen from both sides since the actual battle of Avdivka. And the battle actually extended even further westwards into the center of the town. And that's why maybe my front line isn't as generous to the Russians as it should be. Because here we have a video of what the Russians allege is an RPG hitting a Ukrainian T-64. And so you can see how the T-64, there's uh, it's like an explosion. Then it sort of rolls back and stops. And the crew dismounts and leaves it. 
So clearly that means the Russians are at a close range along Centralna Street, which is the main street bisecting Hrodivka or Novohrodivka. And this occurred near school number four, which is just one of these local landmarks in this region or rather school number seven. And so you can see how much of the region that is being pushed through right now is actually some of the most dense areas in the settlement, areas where you have maybe four, five, six story buildings. And despite that fact, the Russians are continuing to advance and storm those positions rather than taking over the positions further to the south, which are less dense and have private residential areas. And so again, the capture of Novohordivka would have massive consequences for Saidove because then you have this massive Russian flank north of it taking over all these fields overlooking Saidove, overlooking the E50 highway, overlooking uh, some of the roads leading into Saidove from even south even positions that are even further south, like near Vishneve and the Solona River, getting a vector towards some of the slag keeps that are really important for Ukrainian defense, and also avoiding a lot of the trenches that were built by the Ukrainians to the east that were meant to really increase casualties in the case of a frontal attack. You don't have as much on the northern flank because Novohordivka was expected to also hold out in the east, but clearly that didn't happen because the line was infiltrated there. But the more dire immediate issue that is being talked about by the Ukrainians is the fact that the fall of Novohordivka will give the Russians a massive boost in terms of advancing along the rail line and reaching the southern outskirts of Mirnohrad and Pokrovsk. Because after Novohordivka, you really do have two more lines. And this also goes for Hordivka, the, the capture of that town. You really have two more lines of defense for the Ukrainians in this region. You see them mapped out in light yellow. So in terms of a unified line, you have this region that if we're measuring it, it's around five, four kilometers south of Pokrovsk. And it sort of goes in this shape, sort of horizontally, then starts going in the northeastern direction through the northern parts of Novohordivka, Krutiyar, Krasnyar, Mikolaivka. And there are already Russian rumors claiming that they've been able to take over these two particular villages which means they would be knocking on the doorstep of the second defensive line the Ukrainians have. And of course, that's not verified yet, so of course, wait for footage. But we do know that the Russians are nearby in Zhirovka and that they do have the momentum on their side, utilizing the diagonal road, and that the Ukrainian positions in these two villages are actually in front of the main defense line. And so there really are a lot of question marks about how long the Ukrainians could even defend in such an area that is low-lying and is overlooked by the Russian positions to the east located on a local hill. This same local hill also overlooks most of Hordivka, and this is why there is a lot of concern surrounding whether the Ukrainians are able to hold on to the settlement and whether they are already beginning their withdrawal, because some Russian sources are claiming that the Ukrainians are in the process of abandoning their positions within the center of Hordivka, and are preparing to fall back to trenches and local strongholds just to the west because those strongholds, and this is a part of the second defense line, they actually are built on hills and it is a uh, rather solid line, at least on paper. But when you're looking at the actual reality of how the Ukrainians tried to fall back to certain lines and then gaps are immediately exploited, you can't say that with any certainty. But comparing holding out in a low-lying river valley like Khrodivka in an urban setting constantly being bombarded versus just higher elevated regions to the west, you could see the cost-benefit analysis that the Ukrainians here are making. So definitely keep an eye out for whatever Ukrainian movements occur around here. And this defense line that I'm talking about, if you measure it, it's only around five kilometers away from Mirnohrad. And you can see there's a road that directly connects Mirnohrad to Hordivka. This road is so, so close to the front line at this point. It's only about... 1.8 kilometers away from the gray zone that the Russian forces already do have a lot of aerial reconnaissance flying above, spotting Ukrainian vehicles moving in and out, and then fixing artillery or drone strikes onto them. Here's just one example of uh, Russia hitting a vehicle leaving Khrodivka and the drone records all of it. And you could see it in a rather high quality, the explosion and all of that. So clearly the Russian forces are already trying to create these logistical bottlenecks for the Ukrainians. There's one other route into Khrodivka, which sort of extends out of the southern part of Mirnohrad and then runs near this trench line and then reaches all the way into southwestern Khrodivka. This is so close to the front line and this is a really big threat, especially with Russian pressure near Krasnyar. And so even though it's not physically cut off yet, 
it is just so close to the line of contact that you could expect Russian ATGM, small arms fire, whatever it may be to constantly bombard these regions. So from a logistical standpoint, the situation here is really difficult. When it comes to the flanks, it's difficult because the Russians are pushing from the southwest along the diagonal road. They have control over a hill overlooking Hrodivka from the south. They have, of course, momentum with small squads operating and infiltrating directly into the settlement through the main road. And then you also have the northern flank, which we haven't heard much from, but it is still an issue that could theoretically uh, blossom depending on the way that developments turn out. So that's also something that the Ukrainians have to keep in their calculus here. When it comes to the local garrisons, this is another issue. We don't have that many experienced units that have uh, a track record, a proven track record in conducting successful or at least drawn out defensive campaigns in an urban setting. If you're looking at the breakdown of Ukrainian forces in this region, probably the most experienced unit is the 25th Air Assault Brigade, this one over here. The 47th Brigade doesn't really have their theater of uh, responsibility in this region. Most of their battalions are located further south, defending in the region that is east of Selidove. But of course, that's also an issue for them. They have their own problems that we'll talk about. But when it comes to the region of Hrodivka, you have a 25th Brigade. Then you have some special forces elements that may or may not still be present here because a lot of special operations units were moved away from New York, from Pokrovsk towards the situation in Kursk, like the 3rd um, Special Forces Regiment. That's the first one that comes to mind. But looking at the other units here, you have separate rifle battalions. You have National Guard units like the 2nd National Guard Brigade and regiments of National Guard Brigade, so not even the actual full unit, but specific regiments that are either detached or just completely independent. And so again, you're talking about small units that aren't connected to a larger structure, and then they're operating with units that are, aren't even a part of the National Guard. They're a part of the AFU, like the 151st Mechanized Brigade, one of the main units defending here. This is a new unit that did not have any previous combat experience before defending in Pokrovsk, and so all they know is the situation right now. And an issue that I saw mentioned by Deep State today is that the commander of this unit is actually requiring that in certain cases, drone crews will not be able to perform their task, their specialized task of just conducting FEV strikes that sometimes they may actually have to fill in in trenches in an infantry role fighting at the line of contact. And that's something that was explicitly forbidden by Sierski, but he's still doing it anyways, according to Deep State. So they're complaining about that. And that's definitely a reflection of what they need in order to hold on to certain trenches here, especially in the region west of Hrodivka, to prevent a further Russian push deeper towards Mirnohrad. So now, based on reporting from Ukrainian sources that are operating in this part of the front line to The Economist, a lot of the units that have been sent to reinforce the Ukrainian defense here, they are completely new. They had no previous experience. So you see that with the 151st. And then there is a speculation about other infantry brigades created by the Ukrainians. Because in October of last year, they created uh, units spanning from 150th to 159th Brigade. And some of them are mechanized, some are infantry. I think most of the mechanized should be called infantry in the first place based on their equipment. And they, are, they have been in the stage of formation. And a few of them may already be uh, sent to the front line to sort of create uh, or fill up any sort of vacuum that was created as a result of units being moved to Kursk. So you have the 150th Mechanized Brigade, a unit that we don't have combat footage of, but they're claiming that they have all these fundraisers and they're operating around New York and Toretsk. So maybe they're operating in this general theater as well, but it's less related to the actual fighting in Hrodivka. And then there were seven other brigades that are probably not even finalized yet. So we have to continue to wait and see whether they get integrated into the defense here, because even regardless of their uh, unit ability, just in terms of pure manpower, that is something the Ukrainians are looking for because you also have Ukrainian sources from the 68th Brigade talking about how the Russians have a 4-1 to advantage when it comes to manpower. And honestly, sometimes in these articles that are given to Western media, commanders like to exaggerate the extent of the uh, sort of gaps between the Ukrainian and Russian capabilities sort of as an effort to put pressure onto the Ukrainian 
uh, general staff also sometimes to create pressure on the United States to give more aid. So there are a lot of factors in that, but I actually could believe this statement just based on looking at the force disposition, looking at the certain Ukrainian elements here compared to the Russian ones. So that wouldn't surprise me. And then another key point is that the Russians here, they actually have the ability to conduct rotations. Even after the Russians moved away some of their reserves in the Pokrovsk front, like Pietnashka Brigade and a few other uh, PMC units or uh, Marine units that were on the rear, they were moved to Kursk. They still have such enormous depth when it comes to motorized rifle regiments that were created over the past year or DPR units from the 51st Army Corps as it is, or a combined arms army, I believe it's called now, that they really don't have to worry about keeping the same sort of soldiers at the front line for extended periods of time. On the other hand, Ukrainian soldiers for weeks upon weeks, in some cases, they have to man the same trenches and foxholes. And again, that's something that's horrible when it comes to morale and just psychologically and also in terms of just general fatigue. And then it decreases readiness, of course, when the Russians eventually do try to attack those regions frontally. There's also reporting from elements of the 59th Brigade, which is operating a bit further south between Karlivka and Krasnohorovka, that sometimes they've been in the same trenches for two months without rotation. And that is also just a huge issue for those soldiers there. And you could see that the intensity of the fighting has really ticked up, despite the fact that Russian resources, when it comes to artillery crews and air sorties, have been focused a lot on Kursk, despite that fact the Russians do still have the wherewithal to actually increase the pace of their strikes in the Pokrovsk front specifically. So although in other parts of the front line, they have re-diverted large portions of troops and have decreased their amount of daily strikes, here the Russians have only strengthened it because it is clearly one of their top priorities at the moment. Looking at Pokrovsk right now, it has a population of about 45,000. It used to be 59,000, so a lot of people are fleeing every single day. It's in the hundreds, if not more at this point. Uh, civilians that are leaving the city now because the Ukrainians as early as uh, a couple of weeks ago began giving these notifications for citizens to actually leave given the fact that the Russians are now for measuring it just in the most generous perspective around 10 kilometers away and you already have the sort of forward artillery groups moving across the Vapcha River and then they could fire perhaps medium range artillery towards the center of Pokrovsk. There are even reports of FPV drones making it all the way into the center and targeting various facilities over there. So that should give you an idea of how close the Russians are and the people there feel it. And you can see the evacuations, uh, police precincts being evacuated, supermarkets, supermarkets closing, businesses rushing to like finalize accords before they leave, all of that. So there is that sentiment in the city. And again, just to give some closure again, Novohordivka, the capture of that allows the Russians to continue advancing along the same rail vector they've continually used with their small squads that are now aided by additional electronic warfare technology, as mentioned by some of the Ukrainian commanders in the reporting from the economist Mr. Wapo. And so then this presents a big threat for breaking over the second line of defense and reaching within the perimeter of the two cities we've been talking about. And at that point, the final line of defense I'm talking about is this perimeter that isn't really encompassing Mirnohrad. It does from the uh, sort of northeastern direction, but that's not as important at the moment. And then specifically, it focuses much on all of Pokrovsk. There are a lot of local strongholds over here, especially in the southeast. And so an advance from Novohordivka would open up attacks onto that final line. Now, looking a bit southwards, we have another video from Karlivka, which confirms the Russians are now making an effort to advance head on. And at this point, they have the wherewithal to do it because the Ukrainian garrison here, again, isn't as strong. And they're not just putting pressure from one flank. They're putting pressure from the north as well onto some of the dachas there. They're putting pressure even from an area like Ptiche towards Kalinove, which is, of course, distracting some of the forces from the 59th Brigade and the 56th Brigade in this region. And so it is just generally easier now to advance directly through the village than it would have been had those vectors never been open in the first place. So you can see in yellow the advance of the Russian forces over the past 24 hours. And we have this video from the 11th uh, Battalion where they recorded Russians infiltrating into Karlivka, just a column of vehicles like a BTR-70 that was destroyed eventually by a Ukrainian FPV drone. And then you had a few other clips of at least two or three vehicles running over mines and of course suffering damage. The crews abandoned them and run into some of the nearby windbreaks. And then the Ukrainian FPV crews 
they prey upon the abandoned vehicles and strike them. So this is confirmation that the 11th Battalion is still operating around here and that the Russian forces are inching very, very close to actually crossing over the Vavcha River, only about one kilometer away in this particular region. Now, moving on to New York, we have two axes through which the Russians are advancing, and it leaves the area sandwiched in between these two advances in a really compromised position. So I have one video from the Varon group of the 100th Mechanized Brigade, one of the most active drone units in this entire front. And you can see here, based on the geolocation, they were able to conduct FEV strikes onto Russian forces in southern Zabalka, which is this sort of southern suburb of Tretsk itself. The Russians have now actually been able to infiltrate into the first houses. And we don't know through which uh, sort of axis they've been doing it through. To me, it looks like they've just advanced directly from the south from positions near Silesia and the local substation where the Russians have recently been present. For a couple of weeks now, you've had a recon forces and DRG elements that have been able to clear out some of the nearby bushy areas. And now you actually have attempts, serious attempts by Russian assault squads to pass through the forested area, pass through these hospitals, which I don't know who controls them anymore, and actually reach into these houses. And it's a testament to the lack of Ukrainian defenses over here. They have been able to take over an area amounting to around 0.7 square kilometers and advance rather uh, in a narrow fashion, 1.6 kilometers northwards. And so, of course, once they reach that area, they were spotted and targeted by the drones, but it opens up a new avenue for future Russian attacks. And you can see that the actual defense line built over here to defend Zabalka is actually a bit further to the west. So we'll have more of a significance if the Russians try to attack from nearly Pivka, for instance. So the Russians definitely will be taking advantage of the eastern perimeter of Zabalka, which is still currently largely under Ukrainian control. And they have, of course, the forested regions. And that's an area where the Russian DRGs will have a field day, as I've been reiterating, because they will be trying to advance very, very deep and then conduct these sort of infiltrations and jump all the way to the residential areas in a way that Ukrainian reconnaissance and defense wouldn't have expected so quickly. And also this advance really, it makes us question whether the Ukrainians are able to defend this local slack heap, which is supposed to defend the entrance into Zabalka. But if the Russians have already begun to enter, then I don't know about the sort of security of this region, whether there are many Ukrainian forces left here, or if they can stay there for a long time, given the Russian pressure, especially from the 9th Brigade that is operating around here. And then looking a bit further north at Taretsk, Per an update from Deep State, we can see that the Russians have been able to take over territory amounting to, let's see, 0.8 square kilometers. Again, it's interesting because the Russians are able to actually push through the most dense area and the literal entrance into Taretsk. They don't have to conduct flanking operations in this case. They're able to, and of course, this will, will yield higher casualties, but it does make the advance more direct and puts a lot of pressure onto whatever Ukrainian forces are trying to build up defenses in the center of the city. And so you can see the Russian advance really going 1.3 kilometers westwards, really important locations taken like the auto repair shop, local hospital, a few of these residential areas, high rise buildings, which will give the Russians a sort of local uh, point that overlooks the rest of Taretsk because they, of course, elevation wise, more generally are in control of regions that overlook the, the center of Taretsk. But they'll also have a uh, local outpost through which to exert fire towards those regions from a protected concrete slab like an apartment building. So you can see that the advance here has not subsided and it really is a big threat, especially to this local slack heap over here, which at this point has been marked in the gray zone by me. Because just to look at the vector from the north and the positions of the Russians to the southeast, it makes it very unlikely that there is still a mounted Ukrainian defensive resistance in the slack keep, which means that this position that was supposed to be a really massive game changer and was able to, uh, they hoped would be able to hold back the Russians and fire upon them, it's now been rendered superfluous. And now the danger is for whatever Ukrainian force is sandwiched in between the two Russian advances. It's an area spanning 2.3 kilometers. The forested regions will be preyed upon by the Russians. And all the houses in between will be uh, now attempted to at least be cleared out. And then also you have this local slack keep as well, which will provide the Russians, if they advance through this region, another outpost through which to overlook the center of Taretsk directly from a really close area. Now, finally, in Luhansk, I'm going to mention this and not really talk about Kursk today. Probably tomorrow I will. 
It's just there haven't been enough developments there to really make a substantial impact in today's video. And I do want to mention this before I end. So we have this video from the 3rd Battalion of the 115th Brigade, which is one of the main units operating around here. All the battalions have had some sort of efforts in defending against the Russian assaults on Makipka, probably conducted by the 3rd Motor Rifle Division. That's my hunch. And you can see here that they struck a, sh a shelter where the Russians were located just east of the Jarbets River. And this confirms that there is additional Russian control of many other houses in the village. The final Ukrainian positions that they're holding are on the western bank of the river. And the Russian goal now is to find a crossing and actually occupy the houses in the tree lines nearby. With then the goal being to, of course, establish a beachhead that could put really pressure in either direction. Could be north, could be west could be south towards the rest of the Jarabets bridgehead that the Ukrainians have, but the goal is to at least have an outpost across the river in an area where it is rather narrow. Now, at the same time, Deep State, they released an update, which is from an operation that they claim occurred between the 12th to the 15th of August, and this is something that was mentioned by the Azov Brigade, Third Assault Brigade, as they call themselves, and what they're claiming is they took over 5.3 square kilometers of land. They advanced in the northeastern direction around three kilometers, and so they called their offensive here a victory. The goal, according to them, was to knock out the sort of offensive capacity of the 20th Combined Arms Army, which is the general unit in this theater, in particular the 3rd Motor Rifle Division. I think that's the element that's attacking around here. And so Azov, they conducted this sort of counterattack to clear out local battalion positions. And according to the mapping from Deep State, they were able to reach all the way to the Jarabets River, but not actually cross over and that they have positions very close to Novovodiane and also to Karmi Janivka. The issue is they haven't been, been able to actually cross the river. They have been able to occupy the river. What they did, if this is true, is they have been able to prevent the northern flank of Makivka from being utilized by the Russians to squeeze out the Ukrainians, although the Russians are just advancing head-on at this point. And perhaps it creates more pressure onto the road that connects this chain of villages for the Russian forces. And maybe it also puts pressure on whatever Russian forward elements are operating in these forested regions southwest of Karmyzhenivka. And this sort of salient that you see formed over here, it could have been important in the long term towards reaching an area like Rekivka. That was something that the Russians really made no intention of actually uh, doing. There was no indication of them moving in that direction. What we did see was them attacking in Makivka, and the goal was to reduce Russia's ability to conduct attacks. And even if this was successful, we're seeing as of recent dates, even as recently as today, video is confirming additional Russian advances further south. So we'll have to wait and see how the 3rd Assault Brigade releases their video and shows how they were able to conduct these operations and we get all the geolocations before we can make a full assessment of how their offensive or counterattack, I would call it, really went. And so that's all I have for today. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.